Welcome back. All right, so for as long as I've followed hockey, which is a long time now, uh, anytime something historical happens, there's somebody who will crop up and argue that it's not a big deal, or there is somebody that will argue, yeah, that's historical. However, and it, it, it gets to the point of absurdity at times, and I think we're starting to see some of that. So Eric Carlson reaches 100 points on the blue line, 80 games, 25 goals, 25 assists, 100 points. Connor McDavid reaches 150 points. 81 games, 64 goals, 88 assists, 152 points. These are not their final totals. Still got a couple of games for Carlson. Still got a game left for Edmonton and, and McDavid. And we shall see. Now, for Carlson, the difference between what he's scoring and what the other guys below him are scoring is pretty pretty vast. Morrissey's number two on the points list. He's 24 points back. Uh, Quinn Hughes, Brandon Montour, and Dougie Hamilton are 27 points back. And hey... Shout out to Brandon Montour for a great season. He's not going to get a lot of consideration when it comes to the Norris Trophy, but it's been a great year for him. Now, when we look back over the previous seasons and the difference between the, the, the top scoring defensemen and others, you have Yossi last year, 23 goals, 73 assists, 96 points. And Makar was behind him, uh, 28 goals, 58 assists, 86 points. Makar, best defenseman in the league last year. Honestly, if we're talking about the best defenseman in the league, I would still give it to, to, to Makar. The one question I would get asked is, so, uh, or one question I think about it as is, okay, so you're building a team and, and you want to win a championship. Who's your first defenseman? If you can pick anybody, I'm still picking Makar. And that's, that's me. Doesn't mean that's necessarily who you're picking, but that's me. Uh, for Carlson, this has been a big year. And that's part of the reason why we heard so many trade rumors around him, even though his contract makes it hard to move him. Uh, now, 2020-2021, a short season, 56 games. Barry ended up winning in terms of scoring on the blue line with 8 goals, 40 assists, 48 points. Barry, a very good offensive defenseman, not really considered seriously for the Norris. 2019-2020, Carlson, 15 goals, 60 assists, 75 points. Yossi, 16 goals, 49 assists, 65 points, was next behind him. 2018-2019, uh, Brent Burns, 16 goals, 67 assists, 83 points. Giordano behind him, 17 goals, 57 assists, 74 points. And it's interesting with Burns here. So, we look at the season that Carlson's having right now. We see Burns leading the defenseman and scoring in 2018-2019. Part of what's helped Carlson this year is he's the guy now. Uh, you don't have to split time between Burns and Carlson. You want to play Carlson over 30 minutes in a game? You absolutely can. And for the first time in a long time, Carlson looks healthy. He looks healthy. His skating seems to have gotten better. Uh, there was noticeable issues with him when it came to skating. Basically that if the puck was turned over by him at the blue line, he wasn't going to catch the guy who took the puck away from him. And, and you could see this where he just didn't have the foot speed. Uh, so this is this is a change. Now, 2017-2018, John Carlson leads the way with 15 goals, 53 assists, 68 points. And it's interesting that Carlson's led defenseman in scoring twice. And it doesn't feel like he's ever gotten that much consideration for the Norse, considering the production he's had. But Klingberg and Burns were behind him. Uh, Burns was 67 points and Klingberg, Klingberg was 67 points as well. So the difference between the number one and the number two spots and scoring on the blue line are dramatic. And I think that's part of the reason why Carlson's getting the attention now that Yossi really didn't get last year. That's why I find this so odd. Like, I'm not saying that Carlson's accomplishment of 100 points isn't a big deal. But when Yossi hit 96 last year, I didn't hear nearly as much hype. Because, again, with Carlson, there's also the redemption arc. There's the everybody thought he was done. And I don't know if done is the right term, but people said he was, you know, the contract was really expensive and is a really long-term contract. And it still is. Uh, if San Jose decides to trade him this summer, uh, there, there's the possibility they'll have to retain some money. Uh, it might be tricky with the, with the salary cap uh, in all likelihood now staying flat for one more year. Uh, the best time for them to trade Carlson might be a year from now when the salary cap would be going up substantially, right? And for San Jose, they'd have another year of their rebuild under, under their belt a year from now as well. So we go to Connor McDavid's side of the board. And again, this is such an odd thing to do. But since yesterday, immediately people were like, well, what Carlson's doing is way more impressive than what McDavid's doing. 
All right, we'll look at McDavid. So one of the arguments with McDavid is 70 of his points are power play points, thus the PPP. Carlson, 26 of his are power play points. Now, also on Carlson's side, the oddity to me is the fact that he's only played 30 minutes and four seconds of penalty killing time. And I, I think that's noteworthy because very often what defines really good defensemen is how good they are at killing penalties. And... You know, it's it's one of those things that if it's not that important to the voters, okay, cool. But Carlson is not a penalty killer. He's a power play guy. He's a five-on-five -five guy. And he's very often playing high in the zone. He basically plays as almost like a fourth winger out there, or third winger out there, fourth forward. McDavid, on the other hand, the 70 power play points, I don't think detract from him at all. I really don't. Because he has 70 power play points. So it's easy to say, ah, he's just good on the power play. He's fantastic on that power play, that Edmonton power play. If the Oilers win a cup, it will be because of that power play in, on, in some way. It's not just the power play goals that you get. It's the fact that the team that you're playing against really doesn't want to take a penalty, understands how lethal that power play is, and so they play different, right? So for McDavid, I don't see those 70 power play points and go, eh, it's not a big deal. Because it is. Uh, Dreisaitl, 27 points behind him. Uh, Kucherov, 40 points behind him. And Pasternak, 41 points behind him. One argument I've seen as well is, well, yeah, McDavid gets those points, but look at the other guys around him. Okay, none of them are anywhere near him in points. So, to me, that that doesn't make that argument of, I mean, if, if Dreisaitl had 147 points right now, yeah. If, if Nugent Hopkins had 130 points right now, sure. But they're not that close to him, right? And the question of, well, who benefits who could then come up. And, of course, that's completely subjective. 2021-2022, uh, McDavid did not lead the league in such a dominant fashion. He did lead the league in scoring with 44 goals, 79 assists for 123 points. Huberto and Goudreau were behind him, both of them with 115 points. And, of course, they both moved on and... Uh, in terms of the scoring, Jonathan Huberdeau, nowhere near top 10. Johnny Goudreau, nowhere near top 10. So, something about guys with the first name John and the last name ending in O. So, 2020-2021, uh, Connor McDavid recorded 33 goals, 72 assists, 105 points in 56 games. And that was considered to be a fantastic season. However, it was just played within the Canadian division, so immediately people said he would never do that against... Uh, in a regular season against everybody. And here he is with 152 points with one game left to play. That year, Dreisaitl was number two in scoring 31 goals, 53 assists, 84 points. And again, while they were far and away ahead of everybody, the argument was that's just against the Canadian division. It doesn't matter. I disagree with that assertion, but that was what was said at the time. 2019-2020, Dreisaitl led in scoring 43 goals 67 assists 110 points Drew McDavid 34 goals 63 assists 97 points and that was the season where um there were some people who got mad at me because I kept saying Dreisaitl's having a really good year but McDavid's still the better player um and by getting mad at me that means you know getting messages on social media and whatnot along the lines of why are you saying that you're just crazy and because I still think McDavid's the better player and since then, McDavid's outscored Dreisaitl. Not to take anything away from Dreisaitl. It's that whole hating argument all, all over again, right? Um, why do you hate the sun if you hate if you like snow? No idea. Anyways, so, yeah, McDavid, Dreisaitl, that argument was going big that year. 2018-2019, Kucherov led the league in scoring that year. 41 goals, 87 assists for 128 points. McDavid, 41 goals, 75 assists, 116 points. Kucherov, that was a dream season for him. Absolutely fantastic. This year, he's not completely off on those totals. He has got 112 points this year. And it's just kind of a, yeah, that's nice. Uh, then 2017-2018, McDavid, 41 goals, 67 assists, 108 points. Giroux, 34 goals, 68 assists, 102 points. So McDavid's in the top two every year. McDavid is consistently in the the realm of the absolute best when it comes to points producers in the NHL and as I've said many times over I think the best player in the National Hockey League the 70 power play points doesn't change that right so yes 26 power play points 70 power play points means if you subtract those 
But again, I, I always get a kick out of that because I'm like, well, yeah, if you don't count the points, that really evens things out. There's still points. I don't care where you... There's still points. Be like saying, well, yeah, he got 10 shorthanded points, but those aren't five on five. We'll pull those out. So the argument to me is an interesting one. And I, I think the other side of it too that needs to be looked at we have McDavid at 152 points, Carlson at 100 points. We have power plays right now clicking at historically high levels. Uh, the scoring being up in part is because power plays have been so much more effective. So yes, does that benefit McDavid? Sure it does. Uh, it, it benefits the Oilers because they have the best power play in the league, but they have the best power play in the league in part because they have McDavid on it. So that's, that's where that's at with that. I, I don't have any issue with people talking about how great a season Carlson has had. I think you can argue that in terms of his separation from other players, that's impressive. I would say even more than the fact that he has 100 points because last year Yossi had 96. And Yossi, I think, probably played more all-around defensive hockey than Carlson. We're going to have that argument, of course, around Norris time. I do expect Carlson to end up winning the Norris in part because he's dominating in points. But I also expect McDavid to win the Ted Lindsay Award as the best player in the National Hockey League, as voted by the players. Uh, I also expect him to win the, win the heart as the MVP, as voted by the media. So uh, while the argument can be out there of, and, and, and it, it sort of comes back to like when you talk about Gretzky, and well, everybody was scoring points, not like that. So the scoring is up in the National Hockey League this year, which helps... It helps you uh, to see players setting records. Right now, Robertson in Dallas is is just absolutely, you know, just pulling points out of everywhere. And he may very well end up passing Dino Cicerelli for second in the all-time points list in Dallas. I never thought that would happen. Jack Hughes is close to becoming the first 100-point player that New Jersey's ever had. If he doesn't get there this year, he will get there next year. Uh, Patterson hit 100 points last night. But when we see all these guys hitting 100 points and scoring is way up, I think there's 1,100 point scorers right now. We may, we may end up with 13, which <clears throat> would be the most since 95-96. And that season gets mentioned a lot. And that's good because 95-96 was kind of the year before we went into the dead puck era. It was the year before we saw basically the, the, the trap came in and started dominating on a league basis. And it, it just pulled the offense right out of the game. There are those that are cautious regarding the uptick in offense and don't think that it's going to continue for years to come. The one thing is the NHL now understands the incentives to keep the offense in the game. And that when we have McDavid and Carlson putting up these historic seasons, I think they attract more eyeballs to the product. It's the same as with baseball. When home run hitting is up, while you may not be a huge fan, and I personally, honestly, I home runs are great and all, but... When there's eight or nine in a game, I think it gets kind of boring after a while where you're like, well, there's another one. But again, it will attract more casual viewers because they'll be like, wow, that guy's hit 65 home runs. All right, when's he up again? So I do think it helps to, to promote the sport to have more offense in the game. I think the balance is kind of perfect right now. Um, but I've also seen people saying, well, the goaltending isn't any good anymore. Uh, I don't think it's the goaltending. I think it's just there's a lot of skill. Teams are rolling four lines in a way they haven't before in that all four lines can hurt you. And, you know, you look at a team like Seattle and just the depth there. We're not going to see somebody from Seattle on these lists, although Dunn's not far off in terms of defenseman scoring. But that's okay too, right? There's different teams that win in different fashions. And in the case of the Oilers, they win by McDavid and that great power play. And their goaltending's definitely gotten better in the second half as well. For San Jose, of course, they're in a rebuild, which is part of the argument, too, is the closest to him is, I think, Couture is 33 points behind him. But, I mean, then does that lead to the idea that Carlson gets more points because the team behind him isn't as good? So he is the guy you're getting the puck to. He is the guy you're getting the puck from if you're getting those goals. So, again, it's very subjective, but I, I don't think that what Carlson's doing is more impressive than McDavid's because I'm capable of saying they're both very impressive feats. And I, I don't think that you have to... Because it, it is one of the things I've noticed that now it, it almost feels like you have to tear one guy down to push the other up if you're talking about a sport. And it, it's, it's not just in hockey. 
I see it all the time in, in foot, especially in football conversations of uh, if you're talking about a quarterback. You can mention any quarterback and it'll be, well, yeah, but he's not, insert name of other quarterback here. So I, I don't think in hockey we're at that level, but again, if, if what McDavid was doing wasn't necessarily a big deal, other players would do it and we would see other players reaching that mark. We'd see somebody close to him in scoring and we don't. Uh, Carlson, same thing. Uh, and and that's that's the thing is that right now we're not seeing any defenseman anywhere near him in scoring. Uh, Yossi, after a fantastic year last year, has returned to more average numbers for his career, which is still pretty darn good. But when we get to the argument of who the best defenseman in the NHL is, I do expect an argument. Uh, but I also expect Carlson to walk away with hardware, same as McDavid. But let me know your thoughts. Which one... You know, and again, to me, it's it's a soft where they're both very impressive marks, of uh, both very well put together. Um, I I think with Carlson, I think there are those that uh, will really root for him because it does feel like it's an underdog comeback story, and I think he's I think he's playing up to his contract this year. I think he's showing why Doug Wilson gave him all that money, and it's possible somewhere Doug Wilson is saying, "See, I told you, I told you he was good." Uh, but at any rate, there you go. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below, as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happened upon this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.